Hey everybody, welcome to our discussion of chapter 10, The Presidency. Just a heads up that you can now register for spring classes at Inver Hills Community College. Uh, you might even be interested in another political science class. Who knows? We will offer Introduction to Political Science, which is a comparative class. We'll look at countries around the world and their, their politics and their political institutions and their leadership and all that kind of fun stuff. You might also consider Introduction to Constitutional Law. Both would be good next steps after this course. Also, and I think I've mentioned before, but do consider that we have an Associate of Arts Transfer Pathway degree in Political Science. If you become interested in Poli-Sci as a major or in a related major, your transcript will indicate that. It doesn't require that you take additional classes. It just means that your Goal 5, your Social Science classes, you'll take more of those in Political Science. Please reach out to me if you have any questions about that. And here are learning outcomes for the week. We'll define the major roles of the president, including head of state, chief executive, commander in chief, chief diplomat, chief legislator, and chief of party. We'll outline the special powers of the president. We'll identify the purposes of the State of the Union address. And we'll evaluate how presidents have been accused of abusing power and when it's appropriate to use the impeachment process. Okay, who can become president? I know we discussed this earlier when we explored the constitutional requirements for federal offices, federal elected offices. Um, the president of the United States must be 35 years or older, a natural born citizen. Um, now, we also briefly explored some of the controversies. We have had um, candidates for the presidency that were born elsewhere, were born outside of the country, but they were born to American citizens. I think I used the example of John McCain. Uh, the Supreme Court's never ruled on this, but most um, legal scholars, constitutional scholars, believe that the Supreme Court would accept uh, a candidate where both both uh, parents were citizens. Um, of course, there was the completely false controversy on whether or not President Obama was born in the United States. Of course, he was. A birth certificate and uh, documentation from his birth in Hawaii, uh, but there was a... Um, conspiracy theory that was pushed by Donald Trump and others that suggested that these documents were somehow forged. Um, of course, there was no truth to that. Um, the youngest person to ever serve to ever be inaugurated president was John F. Kennedy. The oldest was President Trump. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan was just slightly younger than President Trump when he assumed office. So, um, the, the vast majority of people assuming the presidency have been in their mid-50s when they're initially inaugurated. Um, the process to become president, we discussed this already. Um, the Electoral College, hopefully you understand that. If for any reason a candidate doesn't get the majority of Electoral College votes, that could be um, a tie of 269 and 269 between the two candidates, or... Um, if multiple candidates are able to win electoral college votes, they could deny um, the possibility that someone gets a majority of the electoral college votes. In any of those situations, um, uh, Congress, the House of Representatives, will determine among those candidates who becomes president of the United States. And they don't have to choose the candidate that has the most popular votes or the mo most electoral college votes. They can select from those candidates um, that uh, have earned electoral college votes. All right, well, we put a lot of responsibility on the desk of the President of the United States. Most other countries don't do this. They divide up uh, more of these responsibilities into different positions. For example, if you go to England, if you go to the United Kingdom, uh, the head of state and the chief executive are different positions. Uh, the head of state is the Queen of England. This is the ceremonial uh, head of the government. And the chief executive is the prime minister. So they separate those responsibilities. In the United States, we combine them. So the president of the United States will do ceremonial things like uh, have a state dinner uh, and honor foreign dignitaries. The president will determine who gets the presidential medal of honor, but also be responsible for actually running the federal bureaucracy. And that's the chief executive function. The president's also commander in chief, which is a big deal in the United States because the United States has the most powerful military that the world's ever known. So there's a great deal of power that comes from that. During times of war, during times of conflict, the president's commander in chief powers expand. Um, the president has the power to nationalize the state national guard. 
um, another uh, key um, commander in chief and wartime power. Um, the president is somewhat limited by Congress in his commander in chief function. That is that the president must turn to Congress after um, um, deploying American power, American troops uh, within 48 hours and must seek approval within 60 days. And Congress ultimately has the power of the purse. They can seek to um, defund any action that the commander in chief takes. So if Congress refuses to fund a conflict, that can effectively end a conflict. But still, as commander in chief, the, the president of the United States can deploy military forces um, anywhere in the world. And uh, there's a great deal of power that comes from that. The president's also chief diplomat with the advice and consent of the Senate. The president uh, names uh, the ambassadors to uh, each embassy that the United States has all over the world. The president decides which countries and which governments to recognize as being the official um, government of that particular country. And this can be a, you know, a, a pretty big deal when the most powerful country in the world decides either to recognize or not recognize um, uh, another country. This was uh, the case when the United States waited um, decades to recognize Russia, or recognize uh, the Soviet Union after the Russian Revolution. And the United States did not recognize communist China until almost 30 years after um, uh, the rise of the Communist Party in China and the end of the Chinese Civil War. So this is a power that um, presidents take quite seriously. Uh, the president also negotiates and seeks the ratification of treaties. So the president will negotiate a treaty um, with a foreign government, and that treaty has to be ratified by the United States Senate. Only the United States Senate, not, not both houses of Congress, and two-thirds of the Senate need to agree to ratify a, a treaty. Now, if the president of the United States doesn't want to uh, go through the trouble of getting Senate ratification, the president can negotiate an executive agreement with another country. This is very much like a treaty. It has the force of law. However, um, it does not transcend or extend beyond that president's time in office. The next president can simply overturn that executive agreement, whereas a treaty has the force of law. So that's the difference between those two. Make sure that you understand the difference as you go through your reading this week. The president also has an important legislative function. Each year, the president lays out in his State of the Union address what he thinks Congress should accomplish, what legislation he believes Congress should pass. Um, and the State of the Union message is particularly important when the president's party also controls both houses of Congress. It's, you know, the president setting that legislative agenda. Now, of course, the president can't force Congress to tackle uh, those areas that the president's interested in. But he can certainly uh, influence that and then also take his message directly to the American people who uh, theoretically could apply pressure to their lawmakers. Uh, the president can also, you know, reach out to lawmakers and, and use his influence and his ability to help them get reelected or help them raise money to run for office or run for reelection um, to gather support for the president's legislative agenda. Ultimately, the president has the ability to say yes or no to legislation. The president can sign a law, uh, sign a bill into law, um, or the president can decide to veto that, either veto it um, with his signature or just simply run out the clock, run out the legislative session um, if there is less than 10 days in um, the legislative session, the president can sit on the, 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 the bill and uh, use the, uh, and it becomes vetoed, what we refer to as a pocket veto. Congress does have the ability to override presidential vetoes with a two-thirds majority in each legislative house, but that's pretty hard to come by. Usually we don't see that much partisan advantage in the House or the Senate, so usually vetoes stand. The president is also chief of their party and the country's top politician. This allows the president to raise a lot of money for other candidates for office, raise a lot of money for their political party. The president also can appoint several thousand top level positions within the federal government, 
Most positions in the federal government, those are civil service appointments. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but the president can name some of the top jobs in the White House and, so, and the top uh, political positions in government. So the president can reward supporters with these positions. We refer to that as patronage. Uh, the president has some key constituencies. The president wants to um, certainly have uh, loyalists in positions of party power and governmental power. And the president has to keep key uh, areas of support happy. And that could be moderate members of their party, more activist members of their party, and so forth. The president's power ultimately depends on their approval rating. Are they a popular president? Are they an unpopular president? They have a lot more power. They're, they're a lot more helpful when it comes to um, getting people reelected when their public approval is higher. So we have seen presidents, obviously, at the height of their power. Uh, you look at uh, George W. Bush shortly after taking office, uh, not long after 9-11, President George W. Bush had some of the highest uh, um, levels of public approval we've ever seen for an American president. And not coincidentally, this was also the height of his political power. Uh, the president also has the ability to go public, take their message directly to voters. Um, they can do this through things like the State of the Union message, where um, the president delivers a message not just to Congress, but to the American people as a whole. But the president also uh, draws a great deal of interest during um, press conferences. And of course, it, uh, President Trump has been um, revolutionary, I, I guess, in the sense of his ability to take his message directly to voters through social media like Twitter. Okay, the president has clear expressed powers. Those could be constitutional. They're right in the Constitution. They could be statutory. There are laws that give the president this power. And then there are inherent powers to the presidency that might not be in a specific law or statute. They might not be expressed in the Constitution, but the courts have accepted this presidential action as an inherent power of the presidency. One thing that uh, federal courts have accepted is that during times of emergency, presidential powers expand. Part of this uh, relies on the president's commander in chief function. So during times of natural, natural crisis, uh, natural crisis or um, uh, foreign threats, as it was in 9-11, or a hurricane, these sort of things, presidential powers expand. The president has the uh, uh, ability to declare a national emergency and to provide funding for parts of the country that are affected by those emergencies. The president also has um, some privileges when it comes to denying over some forms of oversight by Congress and the courts. And this is referred to as executive privilege. So, you know, it's assumed that some of the decision making that takes place in the White House should be done in secret. Uh, I think we could all imagine if the president was engaged in discussion about um, foreign surveillance and spying or military strategy, that those conversations probably shouldn't be made public. And the president should be able to claim executive privilege and saying, hey, as a matter of national security, I should be able to have private conversations um, that cannot be disclosed by Congress or the courts, and we shouldn't have to turn over that information. However, the courts have ruled that executive privilege cannot be claimed when it comes to hiding something that's potentially unlawful, unlawful, or even embarrassing. So with both um, President Nixon and President Clinton, they used, they attempted to use executive privilege to hide information that was either unlawful or illegal. And the courts in both cases ruled that they couldn't do that. Another inferred form of presidential power is the ability to issue executive orders. These have the force of law. They can be used to enforce a legislative statute in existing law. They can be used to enforce the constitution or treaties with other countries. They can be used to establish or modify rules of executive administrative agencies. They're not supposed to be used to create a brand new law. That would be the role of Congress. A recent controversy related to this was uh, President Obama's DACA executive order um, deferred uh, deportation for young people who had come to the United States who didn't make that decision, who came to the United States as children, 
and to provide them some legal protection and prior, prioritize deportation of people who either made the decision to come to the United States uh, undocumented or who uh, didn't have family members who were American citizens. You know, so basically the president, President Obama was arguing that he should be able to, through executive order, prioritize who is deported and who isn't. And this was challenged in the courts. Ultimately, President Trump decided to reverse this executive order. That's one thing about an executive order is that the next president can come right in and just do a quick reversal. However, in that situation, the Supreme Court ruled that he had done so in an arbitrary and capricious way that was not lawful. And so DACA continues to stand. He does have the power to reverse it, but he needs to demonstrate some rationale for his, for his reasoning or so ruled the Supreme Court recently. Let's discuss the executive organization around the President of the United States. Cabinet secretaries are the heads of the different key bureaucracies in our federal government. That could be the Secretary of State, that could be the Secretary of Defense. We call the top official a cabinet secretary. Uh, with the exception of the Attorney General, Attorney General heads the Justice Department, um, has the power of a cabinet secretary, we just call them the Attorney General. Um, together, they form the cabinet. The cabinet's an advisory group that the president can pull together to aid in making uh, key executive decisions. A president can decide how much they wanna rely on their cabinet or not. In some cases, they have their own kitchen cabinet, which we refer to as a, a you know, it's, it's a term used to refer to an informal group of advisors that might meet around the White House kitchen table, for example. So the president will decide how much they wanna use their cabinet and what members of their cabinet um, they'll use when it comes to making key decisions. The modern structure of the Executive Office of the President, we refer to as the EOP, was designed during FDR's time in office when federal power was expanding due to the Great Depression, due to World War II. And we continue to use this modern structure. Um, this includes advisory agencies like the national or advisory groups like the national security council the office of management and budget that helps prepare the president's budget um, suggestion the council of economic advisors which advises the president on key economic issues and policy and all of this is coordinated by um, White House staff, and in particular, the chief of staff. And the chief of staff is the gatekeeper to the president of the United States who is organizing um, these staff agencies to assist the president, determining who gets to see the president, who doesn't. So the chief of staff is a very important position that oversees the executive office of the president. Just a nice little visual of the executive organization. Into a discussion about the vice president. Basically, the vice president is as powerful as the president wishes the vice president to be. There's not a lot of constitutional power that goes to the vice president. The president is president of the Senate. This entitles the vice president to preside over the Senate and to cast a vote only in those cases where the Senate is tied. So not a great deal of authority there. And there's been a number of people who have served in the office of vice president that were very dissatisfied with the lack of responsibility that was given to them. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was one such example, Vice President, uh, uh, President Kennedy's Vice President. Of course, he became the president with all the powers that are associated with that job. Historically, vice presidents were selected to strengthen the ticket and, and to improve the chances of winning the election. That was certainly the case of why uh, John F. Kennedy chose Lyndon Johnson. John F. Kennedy was a uh, Democrat from the Northeast, Lyndon Johnson was a Democrat from Texas. Uh, the thought was that this was going to help him win the South. And it was a very close election against Richard Nixon. And probably without um, Lyndon Johnson's participation, um, Kennedy may very well not have won that election. In recent years, vice presidents have been chosen less for political reasons and more to help govern. Um, vice President Cheney was arguably the most powerful vice president in recent history, and President Bush, the second President Bush, gave him a great deal of authority in key areas of, of government. Um, likewise, uh, Bill Clinton's selection of Al Gore. Al Gore had some key responsibilities within the Clinton administration. I think we could also say um, the same thing when it comes to 
Biden and uh, his role in the Obama administration. So in recent years, uh, uh, vice presidents have been selected more to uh, to assist the president and to uh, support the president and actually to help govern. The vice president, of course, is powerful in the sense that they are a heartbeat away from the presidency. So if a president dies, which has happened many times while in office during uh, American history, then the vice president becomes uh, the president of the United States. Um, also, if a president becomes incapacitated, during the Bush administration, he had a President Bush had a medical procedure, President George W. Bush, and during that period of time, he handed over the power of the presidency to Vice President Cheney. So, for a very brief period of time, Vice President Cheney was the president of the United States with the powers of the presidency. Um, so, uh, during those periods of time where the president becomes incapacitated, um, the vice president steps into that. When the vice presidency becomes vacant, the president of the United States can appoint a replacement and they have to be confirmed in the House and the Senate. Here's a table that goes over the line of succession to the president of the United States. We know that if the president dies in office, the vice president becomes the president of the United States. Um, if for any reason uh, it has to go further in that line of succession, which it never has, then the Speaker of the House would become President of the United States, the Senate President Pro Tem. This is the longest serving member of the Senate. And then it is the heads of the different uh, government agencies in the order that they were created. So the Secretary of State was the first cabinet level position created. The first Secretary of State was Thomas Jefferson. So therefore, that person is next in line when it comes to succession to the President of the United States. The last one created was the Secretary of Homeland Security. So that's why that's last. When the President gives a State of the Union address or there is a joint session of Congress where um, uh, many of these individuals would be in attendance, one of them will stay home. They will be, desi they will be considered the designated survivor in the case that there was a massive terrorist attack and somebody in the line of succession would need to uh, rebuild the government. As I'm sure you're aware, presidents of the United States have been accused of abusing the massive power of their office. Um, Congress has a role in checking the power of the president. So does the federal court system. Congress also has the power to impeach, convict, and remove the president of the United States. Um, so in discussion this week, I hope you'll spend some time talking about how presidents have been accused of abusing their power in the past, what you think about that and the recent impeachment trial, and what actions are appropriate for Congress to take under our constitutional system to check presidential abuses of power. All right, let's briefly go over the impeachment process. Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution gives the House the sole power of impeachment. Um, people often misunderstand the term impeachment, too. Impeachment does not mean to convict somebody of a crime. It means to charge them with a crime or to indict them with a crime. So the House, by a simple majority, can determine whether or not they want to impeach or charge the president with a crime that warrants removal from office. If a majority of members of the House vote to impeach, then the Senate will conduct a trial. If two thirds of the senators vote for conviction, the officer is removed, the federal officer, including the President of the United States. Okay, let's summarize. The President's roles include both formal and informal duties, which include head of state, chief executive, chief legislator, commander in chief, chief diplomat, and head of party. Abuses of presidential power are dealt with by Articles 1 and 2 of the Constitution, which authorizes Congress to impeach and remove the president, vice president, or other officers of the federal government for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, if you're wondering what that phrase means, well, we're continuing to argue about that. It could be that a presidential action is not necessarily a crime, but it rises to the standard that Congress feels is unacceptable for the office of president of the United States. It could also be that the president has committed a crime, but it doesn't rise to the standard of what Congress sees as treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. We continue to have that debate. The president receives assistance from their cabinet, 
and also from the executive office of the president. That's the bureaucratic structure around the office of the presidency. The 25th Amendment establishes procedures for presidential incapacity, death, or resignation, and when, filing, when filling a vacant vice presidency. Okay, folks, here are your guiding questions for the week. They will also be posted in the weekly discussion area. One substantial original post and at least two responses to the on-topic posts of your classmates for a perfect score for the week. Uh, we are in the last month of new material here, so do reach out to me with any questions or concerns as we rack up, ra wrap up the course and have a fantastic week.